All right. Well, get this. Um, so my parents came to town last weekend, and we typically go to church in town here. Um, but my mom wanted to go to church uh, out by our house in Roswell. Uh, so we go, we hop in there and uh, sit on the front row, and uh, the pastor's talking about humility. And I'm like, sweet. I said, Mom, he's going to write my speech for me. Um, but uh, no, um, you know, being a creative person, my mind typically goes everywhere. So what I did, cat, uh, you know, grab from uh, the morning sermon was, this question he asked, and it was really cool, um, and you can think about it before I get into other stuff, but the question was, would you rather be a celebrity or a servant? So I thought that was a really cool question, um, and I'll give you the answer towards the end. But, um, but first, um, one, of the big thing, one of the big questions, and I thought I would talk about this because it is creative mornings. We talk about the creative aspect and of what I do, and people ask, like, how do you do this? And Oh, Ford Fry and all this blah, blah, you know, and I'm like, I, I'm like, I really don't, you know, but let me, let me show you kind of how the process works, which is kind of cool. And I love it. I get to pick like the best part of restaurants and everything. Um, I, I because, uh, I'll show you. <laughs> okay. So I could likely say that this is the beginning, but it really wasn't. This was uh, I think I was visiting another kid's Sunday school class, and everyone got a carrot. So it wasn't like I was drawn to that carrot <laughs> by any reason. Um, this is the reason I'm in it. Uh, this is Grammy and Grandpa. Uh, Grandpa uh, is kind of a scholar and has a vocabulary that no one could ever imagine. Grammy is just uh, incredibly nice. They were very generous. Uh, he was a doctor in Texas, and uh, they took us me and my two sisters um, traveling a lot. You know, we went to Europe two times. We went to Maine, uh, we went to California, we went to Colorado, and everything was always around food. Um, so I knew, so, so I was naturally, you know, gravitized towards food and eating, and I loved it, and uh, so all my memories, I mean, I remember all the restaurants I went to when I was a little kid, and I remember what I ordered and what I ate. Um, so that's crazy. So. Um, thanks to them, uh, I think they really drove me to, to, to what I'm doing today and what I really love. Um, but before, uh, so starting a restaurant, um, and this is really the fun proce process, is that um, it starts with like a, a, you know, a, a passion or an idea of something like, hey, I'd really like to see this in Atlanta, or I'd really want to cook like this, or I really want to go to this restaurant or because I want to have this or whatever. Um, but it's tough, you know, sometimes you, um, so you have this one idea and if you try to find a location for that one idea, it may not be right. That idea may not be right for uh, that neighborhood or that community or whatever, and they may not need something like that. So I think that's where humility kind of comes into play. Uh, right there is where it starts. Um, because you can't say, hey, I am Joe Chef and my food, they're gonna come no matter what. That's just, it's just not true. Um, it's got to be the right thing. You got to do it right. And it's, 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 uh, it's got to be right for what the customer wants or what our guests really want or what the town really needs or what our community really needs. Um, so this is how it started. So I'm going to give you a couple examples. Um, the Optimist. Um, the Optimist started with, uh, I was doing a dinner uh, in New York at the Beard House with, um, Oh, Linton Hopkins and Hugh Atchison and a few other guys, and we were eating around in a couple of places that were just like like Mary's Fish Camp or Pearl Oyster Bar, and you know we were all sitting around eating, and we're like, you know, there's nothing cool like this in Atlanta. There's nothing that that's just classic. Everything is so corporatey. You got to be dressy. Um, this is awesome because it's like super high quality food, but you can, as you can see, I'm pretty casual. This is this is as dressy as I get. But um, I wanted a place to go where, um, you know, I didn't have to dress up, where you go and you feel like you're on vacation. So, so what I do is, so I start off with putting these little pictures together, um, and, and I don't even make it look this pretty, but I'll kind of gather some of the pictures, and then Alvin will, will take it and from there, and he'll put it into a nice little, little uh, storyboard. And, and as chefs, um, we're, you know, we're not the smartest tools in the bucket. So 
we we kind of we kind of go off of visuals. So we have to see an inspiration. I'm like, this is what I want to create because I can't get it out of my mouth. I can't tell you what I want. I have to kind of show you what I want. So this was kind of the inspiration piece. Um, this guy here, Soul George, if you know, you know that's from uh, uh, Wes Anderson film. So this this is a little element of of humor that is always like we don't take our restaurants so seriously. We sit around and we laugh, like, would it be cool to do this? Or it'd be funny to do this. It's, it's just not that stuffy. So, uh, so a lot of it I go through, and you know, my hands are on, first and foremost, the food, because um, that's really where my passion is, but everything else plays in effect. The music goes into play, uh, all the fixtures, light fixtures, you name it, um, I'm putting my hands on, because I love doing that. Um, so this is kind of the end, you know, you see where the branding comes out and this is how it kind of translated into uh, the optimist. Um, this is the next one here too. So this one, you know, hasn't translated yet, but this is the first uh, pitch page of, uh, of Marcel. And Marcel is on the west side across the bridge from JCT. Um, and this is, you know, I have this passion. I know a lot of chefs out there and I don't know, hopefully you guys will understand this. There's a lot of chefs who kind of try to get into modernist and modern cuisine and doing crazy things and so forth. And, and I've always been one of those guys that like, like, like take me back to high school when, I don't know who, I'm 45, but if people remember like when everyone started saying the word awesome and everyone was like, that's awesome, that's awesome. Well, I would fight that and I wouldn't say the word awesome because I thought they're just trying to be cool and I don't want to come across that I'm trying to be cool. Um, <laughs> So I wouldn't say the word until now. Now I'm way behind, but I'll say it now. Um, so when it comes to food, um, I really, you know, as I get older, it's like, gosh, I just really want something to taste good. You know, I really want it. So, so, so Marcel, uh, you know, is all about the total lack of, uh, um, what do you call it? You know, the, uh, innovation. No innovation whatsoever I'm seeing in this place, okay? <laughs> I see this as just the opposite and table-side Caesar salad. Yeah, right, I invented that. No, I didn't, you know, but, but uh, I mean, who doesn't like, you know, just... So, so this, this restaurant's going to be all about just high quality, the highest quality possible, the most retro we can go possible, get back to like the 1940s or whatever. So it's really just going to be fun. Um, so, and then at this point, so this is all done. We start, we start doing this stuff. Um, and that talks to, uh, I'll leave that out there. That's, I've kind of spoke to that already. But um, a lot of it is, is when, at that point, okay, so I go to, I start talking, I start working with a chef at that point in time, you know, and that's when the handoff occurs, you know. There is an actual handoff really close to that time where I allow that Marcel or whatever to be that chef's and not mine anymore. That's where I kind of give it away and in, in, in myself, in my heart, I'm giving it to them. Say, this is yours. Take it, run with it, be passionate about it. Um, I'm there to serve you, okay? I'm there to serve you, and I'm there to kind of keep you on track and teach you where you need to be taught. But otherwise, I'm not going to say much unless I need to. Um, and the, 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 the awesome thing about that is that they own it. And at that point, they own it, and it's theirs. It's their baby, and they put everything into it. Um, and then my job right there is to serve them and to reward them and let them take the, take the credit for what they've done. So I've kind of given them the idea and some of the parameters but um, at that point, it's really theirs. All right, next one. Um, okay, so, so to me, everyone asks, well, how do you do it? Well, I don't, you know, I really don't. It's, 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 it's giving it up to these people. It's giving it up to everybody every day who, uh, you know, comes in and busts it and... So to me, that's, that's, where, that's where I get my most gratification because I go, because like we were just sitting um, uh, at our, my brother-in-law's ranch. So we have our little annual retreat. And I'm sitting around the room with, we, we have our highest level VPs and they are 
uh, all sitting around the room. And we did it last year was the first time. And I'm looking at them and I'm, and I'm trying to fast forward to the future. And I said to them, I said, you know, I really can't wait for 10 years down the road to be looking at everybody. And I'm thinking to myself, I didn't say this to them, but I want to see them and their families, you know, grown and built through, through me helping them and me serving them. Um, and I can't wait for that day. You know, the day hasn't come yet, but I really can't wait for that time to come. Um, so, so it goes back to that question of, would you rather be a servant or a celebrity? And uh, being in this world of uh, chefs and celebrity chefs, um, more often than not, uh, chefs tend to, you know, gravitate to, you know, what people are saying about them and their egos kind of get, get going. And, and that's just something I don't want at all. Um, I have this passion. It's, it's kind of it's odd to sit there and say, hey, I'd rather serve. It's kind of counterintuitive to what, what we think in this world and, and how, we're, how the world kind of talks to us. It's like, well, if you're a servant, you're kind of lowly, you're, you're thought of. But that's, uh, it's, the, why it's counterintuitive is that it's, you know, by serving, it almost elevates you even more than that. So, um, and it's good for everybody. So it's something we all kind of miss in some sort of way. Um, so that's what I talk about. That's what I talk about to my crew. Um, that's what I talk about to people coming in. They don't typically try to, they don't believe me when I tell them, I said, this is going to be yours. You know, I want you to own it. I want you to have passion about it, uh, passion for, for it and what you're doing. Um, but, uh, uh, but I love that. I love it. That's, that's more gratifying than putting a, writing a menu or whatever and taking the credit uh, for certain things. Um, I mean, I see, I see nice words out there in uh, social media. I see words that are uh, maybe not so nice. It's fine, you know, but um, for the most part, um, the nice words kind of come and go really quick in my mind. Um, you know, I like reading it, but for the most part, you know, where I'm going to find my most gratification is from watching my people grow and so forth. And, and I look at that, I take that on as myself, it's like my responsibility, it's my responsibility. These people, not only this person who works for me, but their wife, their kids, or their spouse and their kids, um, and how we treat them and how we coach them and how we bring them along in life is, you know, is my responsibility. So I take a lot of that and I put people, uh, my wife is here, she'll probably, she'll probably tell you the same thing, is that, that, that typically I'm putting everyone else before me and for, for me, it's typically my family, too. Um, but for the most part, it's uh, always thinking about putting someone in, 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 in front of us, you know. And back to that sermon, I'm going to steal a little bit more from him, but um, he talked about uh, that it's something you have to work at. Something, humility is something that you have to work at. And, and I'm not sure about that for me. I mean, I don't, for some reason, the way... I don't know if it's my grandmother or who it was, but for some reason I don't feel like I have to work at that. I feel like it just comes and I understand it. Um, maybe I don't. Maybe I just maybe it just came from a from a little kid. But um, for the most part, that's how it that's how it works. That's how uh, the restaurants are started and continued. Um, you know, we'll see where it goes. But um, my my the the thought that always goes through my mind is the day that I think that it's all about me um, is the beginning of the end. Um, I think at that point in time, um, your your mind is just not on the right focus. You're not doing it for the right reasons, and um, it gets a little scary at that point. So. Um, for me, it's not all about me, you know, and I'll challenge all of you guys to hold me accountable. If you ever see me acting like it's all about me, come smack me upside the head <laughs> um, because that's, that's not what it is. So, um, and also, I mean, it, it, uh, I'm a little early, but um, this is really cool. I'm really glad to be uh, asked to be here. Um, I, I, I have a uh, – when I see people, I see faces, my, 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 my initial – 
uh, thought was like, wow, these are just awesome people. They're really cool. There's, the, there's all different types of people, and I'm glad to be here and glad to be asked, so thanks for having me, and I hope I spoke about everything and not too quickly. <laughs> um, All right, it means more time for the Q and A, so it's all good. Uh, any, we're gonna do a Q and A. So if you have a question for Ford, raise your hand. He'll call on you, and then I'll try and run a mic to you so the video has your question. Okay, so you can call on whoever. I saw yours first. <laughs> so can you share with us um, a memory of a meaningful meal, whether it was one that you prepared or one that you enjoyed, and why it was meaningful? Okay, I'm gonna go back to, I was in Paris with uh, my grandmother and grandfather, and we went to this place, and back then I'm thinking, okay, this is the best place in Paris. Uh, now I realize it's a pretty big tourist trap. But um, <laughs> it was called Tour d'Argent, and they're known for their duck and the, the pressing of the duck. So what they're doing is they're roasting the duck, and then, so I'm a little kid, you know, drinking some sort of Shirley Temple or something. And, uh, and I'm watching this little thing where they're taking the duck and they're cutting it off. And they're putting the bones in this press and they're grinding it and squeezing all the juices out and making the sauce. So that's what I ordered. So, I mean, I remember that to this day. I don't remember if I liked it or not. I'm sure I did. You know, I liked everything. But, um, but that was my most memorable thing that comes, comes to my mind first. How do you go about uh, finding the chefs for your restaurants, and um, do you have to build trust with them before you hand over the uh, the menu reins? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it started with um, Drew Belleen, who was with. Um, uh, that's where I, I had this initial passion of of because I saw him. He was working at Float Away Cafe, and he had always talked to me about, "Hey, I want to start my own thing and whatever." And um, but then I thought about there's so many awesome chefs in Atlanta, so many awesome good dudes, and they just don't have the, maybe they don't have the money to get it going, you know, or the resources to do that. So, so it started with someone I knew, and the, so the first few were people that I knew, but now um, it's getting to a point where we're kind of generating them from within. Um, and the goal, the, the goal of, I guess I've got about six or seven chefs right now who are working with me who are all super strong um, and what I my promise to them was I mean if there's some chefs out here I mean typically executive chef is like the landing point that's that's you made it you know and so what I'm telling them is that's the beginning you know executive chef needs to be be the beginning for you so so what I've what we've done is we've taken like someone like a Drew and he was the chef of 246 and at this point where he starts acting like an owner and he starts he understands that. Uh, then we have him oversee something else, you know. So he st he becomes like a vice president chef, or whatever. He's still cooking all the time, but he's got more responsibilities and so forth. So at this point, it's not about bringing in too many more chefs. It's about uh, elevating and training and building up the ones that we currently have and the ones that I've kind of made promises to to developing them in their career. And then after, say, to your to your question about. Um, when we open a restaurant, uh, that is that is that is totally it. You know, I kind of set the parameters, and then quickly they they t they tend to get it. But um, if they don't get it quite right away, there's a little period where they'll be texting me pictures. I mean, I don't make I don't I don't have to show up and physically taste something. Like they'll text me, hey, what do you think about this? Can I, you know, you okay if I do this? And I'm like, and they'll send me a picture and talk about it, and I'll understand what it is and. I'm like, yay or nay or change this or whatever. But for the most part, it's fairly quick. But yeah, there is a little bit of process, a little bit of time before they get uh, the leash taken off, I guess you'd say. There you go. How are you? I'm great. Um, I just want to say I love Atlanta. Um, I'm not from Atlanta, though. I'm from Baltimore. So yeah. how do you feel about Obey seasoning? Love it. I love it. I love it. I, I'm, I'm, I, I'll, I'll switch back and forth from Old Bay to Tony, who, anybody from Louisiana, but Tony's, uh, Tony's Sacheries or whatever. Uh -huh. um, but Old Bay is classic. It's classic. <laughs> Thanks. How about back there? 
Um, hey. hey, I'm curious about who you, your mentors are and how you went from that place of executive chef to where you're at. I, you know, oddly enough, like from a chef perspective, I didn't really have um, great mentors. I'd say, I'd say what, where I learned the most was from going into debt uh, by going out, to, <laughs> going out to eat all the time. Um, once I learned technique and, and how to really make most everything and, and all the, the basics and fundamentals of everything, then I could kind of pick that up from eating out and around. Um, so I wasn't privileged enough to have that great, you know, chef mentor. Um, how I was able to, um, it's tough. I mean, starting your own business is really, the hardest part is finding uh, the money and it takes so much more money than anyone can ever imagine to start a restaurant. And uh, I was lucky. My sister married a good dude. Um, uh, so um, he's like, we're skiing. And he's like, uh, he says, we need to, let's just find a location. And, you know, we'll, we'll, wherever you're passionate about that time and whatever works, let's, let's go do it. So once, once I did one, the first one, uh, which was JCT, it was right about the recession time. Well, it was a little before the recession time. So we had about a year to kind of grow a little bit and uh, but he was he's he's very uh he's an alarmist uh he's he's always um he's the type that feels like he needs bulletproof glass and things like that because people are going to take all his money that kind of thing but he uh he uh but over time he was kind of proved wrong we kept you know our sales kept going up and we we performed so we really never had a losing month um, at JCT, or we never had a losing month at any of the restaurants. So he's like, okay, well, this is good. We're making, we're doing well. You understand how to run the business. And at that point, it was just open the floodgates and get, I mean, I, you know, we're actually moving slow, according to him. So, <laughs> so. That's you. How do you know when it's time to start something new? Well, I have a hard time saying no uh, to begin with, so there's, it's always a good time to start something new in my mind. Um, I guess the time I know when it's not a good time is when all my, you know, any partner says, or any of our operating guys who work with me say, all right, I'm buried or I'm too, too much. Uh, so far, they haven't said that. Um, but I'm kind of looking at it now as... I think we kind of pushed pretty hard, so now is a little bit time to slow down a little bit. We talked about slow down a little bit and really kind of uh, massage things, but we've said that before, and so I don't think there's ever a good time. <laughs> it's just because that's what I love doing. So it's like whenever something, if there's if the opportunity is there and the city needs something, then let's do it. You know, if the city doesn't need it, then there's no sense forcing something. Uh, you back there. So I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, if you had to, what would you make us to eat right now? Oh, wow. <laughs> Are you hungry or? <laughs> um, you know, um, one of my favorite things is, is Dungeness crab. You know, I hate to say that because it's not local at all. But it is just so good. So what I would probably do is like, you know, cut some holes in it, stuff it with some really tasty butter, and then probably roast it over wood. And then I'd lay it all on the table for all you guys to crack it and eat it. It's just my favorite. That's what I'd make. Hey, how's it going? Good. So um, I've lived in Houston for uh, a little bit, and I saw yeah. the progression. I think it's near Westheimer. Yes. So I guess my question is... Um, What's your plan for the future? Do you see yourself expanding in different markets, more so taking over Houston or going to different cities? Because mm -hmm. I know probably going into a new city is a lot, a little bit more difficult than kind of expanding in one city. So like, yeah, what's your plan for the future? Right, I mean, Houston is where I grew up, so, um, and my partner is there, um, and family's still there. So, uh, you know, c briefly my thought was to, do kind of have fun with what we did here, but take it and do it in more Texas. I mean, I really love Austin. Um, 
I, I'm really like in Houston now. I mean, I grew up there and I grew up in a good area, but, and I, I just kind of stayed away because it's like hot and muggy. And, um, but Houston's really come around. It's been become pretty cool. So we'll see, you, you know, the gas, the, the oil prices are down. So Houston's going to take a pretty good hit. So, so we're going to go slow there, but I want to do, but it's going to be difficult. It is going to be difficult because it's our first one. It's right across the street. I went to the two schools that are right across the street. So, um, and I know there's a bunch of hype, so I don't know. There's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of weight on my shoulders with this one. So that's kind of the plan. Um, uh, but so far, it's just kind of going going as we go, you know. But but Texas would be fun. Yeah, let's go over here. There you go. So just curious is uh, what kind of concerns or fears do you have to sort of move through as you're building a new concept? In hindsight, JCT is a smashing success, but as you're moving into a new concept, you know, what concerns or fears do you have to sort of move through? I mean, I think the, and this is something we talked about yesterday in our meeting, but um, really it's about, you know, there's a certain number of people who get that, that culture um, spoken to a lot. Um, from the top, and the, fa the faster we move, the more it gets diluted. Um, so, so that's my concern: is that we move too fast, you can't uh, teach and train underneath and maintain that that culture of um, what it is and what made say JCT successful. And and really, the 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 key word, and this is what we came up with. We had, we had a great meeting yesterday, and and it, it was about like JCT. I was always about not wanting to lose investors' money, especially family investors' money. But, um, and I've always looked at, you know, you look at restaurants as a kid. When I was a kid, it was like, you go out to Bennigan's or TGI Fridays, there, or if it was a nice night out, you went to, it was your birthday, you're going to steak and ale, you know? There wasn't, there wasn't that much stuff. So I started thinking about, I wonder about these restaurants who've been around and they're so old and they're so tired, what do they do, you know? So my goal for JCT was, how do I make this thing timeless, you know? How do we catch it also, you know, before it gets tired and refresh it? Um, so that's my passion. So now, so now that's, that's our goal. So we want to, to be able to teach that mentality um, to all the other restaurants, where I don't think we're there in all the restaurants, quite honestly. I mean, I think there's some that, that you know, have a, like a could, could have a good, uh, good long run, but um, some of them I think are a little bit, you know, not focusing on um, long term, hey, what's the right thing? What do people want to do? What's going to bring someone back, you know, week after week? So that's my concern mainly is in, until we have that solid philosophy embedded into everyone's mindset um, as opposed to, hey, I'm just going to be the chef of the month type of thing, um, then, I, then I fear moving quickly there what's your favorite restaurant and you can't choose your own <laughs> well um, <laughs> um you know it's different i mean i like uh you know i'd, I'd say overall i'd say like float away cafe was always a real was was a was a good one for me um, back when Annie was working, she would, when she was working there, um, I remember one day walking in the kitchen, and she's not the most outwardly person, but I think she was like, I think I caught her off guard, and she was all stunned a little bit. But the food, uh, and I've been a few times, but like I, I mainly eat out when I'm out of town. I don't eat out unless I'm eating barbecue or something in town. But but I would say Float Away um, uh, was has been one of my one of my favorites. It's it's one that people forget about too. Let's go over here. One, one more after this. We'll do a girl. Um, yeah. Um, so I just moved here a month ago, and my question to you is, how do you support the local food movement and all the amazing farmers that have come up in the last 10 years in Atlanta, where there used to be one farmer's market, there are now too many to visit on any one day? Yeah, it, it's funny because I was talking to um, our chef from Craig. He works at St. Cecilia. We were doing a dinner, and he wasn't working. We were doing a, a charity dinner um, at one point when he wasn't working for me or working with me. Um, 
and he was talking about that he, he had a bad day, he said. He's like, he's like, yeah, you know, I'm being told I can't buy this from this person or I can't buy that from that person. I need to go to this person to buy this because it's cheaper or whatever. And I said, that's funny. I said, because our philosophy is like, you know, we will probably part ways if you don't buy from the highest quality and the most local and local farmers. You know, that is just a, that is a must. Um, and some people say, well, it's just more expensive. And then I'm like, well, you've got to figure it out. You know, I'll help you figure it out. But, um, and, and something that, that, um, so that is, that is something that we kind of demand of our chefs. Um, so it has nothing to do with profitability. It has to do with quality. So, um, I remember I went to a restaurant in Houston where there was a, there was a female chef and she was so into the, the local movement. This was before I even knew what recycling was. Um, so <laughs> Texas, the, they don't, there's not much of that, but I noticed these, I, I noticed these tomatoes, you know, and they weren't, I'm like, huh, she was displaying these tomatoes, these little tomatoes. And they're like, they weren't like really bright red and they didn't have the vines on them and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, but then you taste them and you're like, wow, that's awesome. It's not engineered to be like bright red, but it tastes really good. So at that point, it's just, there's, there's not a question in my mind uh, that we have to buy. You buy locally, you're getting it the freshest. It's coming right out of the ground. So it is a hands-down must. How about that one? Uh, what is your biggest pet peeve about dining in Atlanta? And then what is the one Atlanta dining experience we should all make sure to have right now? <laughs> um, God, that's tough. Um, let's try to start with the one dining experience that you must have right now. Um, oh my gosh. I'd say, um, anyone not been to Boca Lupo? Anyone been to Boca Lupo? That's a good one. Um, it's rare where you find uh, the chef owner actually on the pasta station every night. So um, that's something that's interesting. Uh, that's something that's good. I think I think should be tried. Um, I think uh, on the on the horizon, Staple House that is opening soon will be the don't miss um, because of the cause. Because of the I mean Ryan is a fantastic chef. Um, I think he's called Smith these days, um, but uh, but that would be something to miss. Um, pet pet peeve, um, my pet peeve, uh, and this is going a little bit back in Atlanta, is where uh, the managers and so forth in are are, are too stuffy. You know, um, I love a more casual feel. Um, there's been restaurant groups in town that you'd go in and everyone's wearing a suit and tie and it's like, oh, it just makes me feel uncomfortable. So, so I love, I love um, an experience of where, um, and I noticed it in San Francisco, I went to a place called A16 and the coolest thing was the waiter, the server was so humble, uh, he didn't act like he knew everything, um, but when we asked him any question, he knew everything. Um, and, uh, that's what I feel like Atlanta could really use. People who know everything but don't, don't come across like they know everything. So. Let's give Ford a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs>